Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor, Sony Imaging Ambassador, and the topic of this video tutorial is the firmware updates for the Sony Alpha 1 camera. We're looking at the version 1.3 update. Now, if you want to check the firmware update that you're currently running on your camera, go to the yellow setup menu and you're looking for that version. Once you've clicked on that version, you will be shown the firmware that you're running on your particular camera. If you're not up to date, i.e. you're not running version 1.3, 1.3 or later, then you're going to need to head over to the Sony website and look for that support link. In the field, you'll probably want to enter ILCE-1 and then you'll be given the link to go over to that support page for your camera. You'll then want to go to the download section and then you'll want to look for the version of the firmware update that's supported by your computer system, whether it be a PC or a Mac. Now, if you're running a Mac, it will be further complicated because you probably need to unlock the security preferences depending on whether you're running a silicon M1 chip or the older Intel processors. If you've uh, at all um, uh, phased by the idea of updating your firmware, you possibly want to ask your camera store where you purchase your camera to see whether they offer that service for you. Or perhaps uh, borrow a friend's uh, PC where it is a little bit simpler to run the firmware update. If you will do want to push ahead using your Mac, you'll probably want to click on that link, which is how to change the security policy on Mac computers with Apple, Apple Silicon uh, chips there. And then you'll want to download the Sony camera driver for either Apple silicon chip or the older Intel processors. And you have to do this before running the update on your Mac computer. OK, so let's take a look at the benefits and improvements of the 1.3 update. Now, I'll focus on the top four line items here because the others are just minor fixes. The bullet points at the top are for improved features that you'll be adding with that 1.3 update. So I'll go through these in turn. First off, it allows you to select M and S sizes. That's uh, medium and small sizes of RAW files when shooting in the lossless compression uh, um, RAW file format. And this has been a feature offered by Canon and Nikon cameras previously, but this is the first time it's being offered by a Sony. Sony Alpha cameras. The firmware update also promises to improve the accuracy of IAF and I'll go into this in some detail. Then there's a couple of video uh, centric features, which is it adds 4 to 2 10 bit uh, video recording when recording in the XAVC HS 8K. Now, this previously was only available in 4 to 0 8 bit, so this is quite a big advantage for those people who want to record in um, uh, 8K. It also allows you to do a proxy recording uh, when connected to a, um, a remote computer connection. Now I'll go into a lot more detail about the stills here because the two video uh, performance features are sort of self-explanatory, but I probably want to go into those stills features in a little bit more detail. First off, this is quite a busy table, so I'll run you through uh, what we're looking at here. I have uncompressed, lossless compression, and compressed. And then I also have uh, the last column, which is compressed APS-C. So what I'm doing on that uh, first row um, is giving you the pixel dimensions. Then I'm giving you the uh, the pixels in megapixels. And then I'm going to giving you the approximate uh, file size in megabytes. And in the next um, row, I'm giving you the, uh, the maximum frames we can record in those uh, uh, raw file formats when using a CF Express Type A card. And I'm listing that at 20 frames per second and also 30 frames per second when we're looking at compressed and compressed APS-C formats. Now, the newer uh, file, raw file formats are in the uh, lower half of this chart, so we'll focus on those. And the two new ones are small raw and medium raw. Now, we are dropping the megapixel size when choosing small raw or medium raw. Now, this is lossless compression. 
Um, so we are getting the full 14-bit files when choosing these uh, uh, smaller raw formats. So the the smallest is the 12.44 megapixels, and the medium is 21 megapixels. Now we'll see that that 21 megapixels is actually the same as when we're recording in APS-C mode. And of course, if you choose APS-C mode, shooting in that lossless compression, now the uh, the pixel dimensions and megapixels are the same. But what we will do is we'll get um, um, slightly more frames that we can uh, capture in a sequence when we're shooting at uh, 20 frames per second. We can see we can triple the number of frames we can shoot when shooting at 20 frames per second. Now, um, why shoot in small or medium RAW? A lot of people will say, well, what's the point of shooting in a smaller, a lower resolution count when you've gone to the trouble of buying a high resolution 50 megapixel camera? Well, there are a couple of reasons when we don't need to crop tightly in post-production editing, when we don't need to be making huge prints, we're basically creating images for screen viewing, and when we need to shoot with less megapixels but retain the angle of view of the lenses we are using. We could previously drop the megapixel count by shooting in APS-C mode, but of course that gives us a 1.5 crop factor um, and narrowing the angle of view of our lenses. So now we can shoot in these lossless compression formats, small and medium, and retain the angle of view of the lenses that we're using. So this will be a popular update for some, but not all photographers. This slide is showing you some of the relative sizes between um, resolutions of sensors that we can be using in different cameras and how many uh, pixels we actually need to fill a 4K screen, which is just 8.3 megapixels. So we can see even with the Alpha 7 IV at uh, 33 megapixels and the Alpha 1 at 50 megapixels, we've got way more pixels than we actually need for somebody who is preparing images for 4K screen viewing. Now, there are some advantages to shooting in higher resolution, but sometimes we don't need that many megapixels as uh, indicated by this particular slide. To give you another example, another comparison, is here I'm uh, magnifying a view to 100% on a large uh, 4K monitor. And there's the relative size of the 50 megapixel image, which would pretty much wallpaper the room that I'm sitting in if we were going to that full resolution. And of course, um, we can maybe get some of that resolution if we're outputting to an 8K monitor uh, over 40 megapixels, but often uh, that 50 megapixels is just way too many megapixels for preparing images for screen viewing. So what happens is when we're um, exporting images from, say, Lightroom for screen viewing, we're basically just dumping 42 megapixels that are surplus to requirement. Now, one could say, if, if I'm not going to be cropping aggressively in post-production, uh, why am I shooting in the full resolution of the sensor? So this small and medium raw uh, file formats now give uh, photographers the choice of downsampling in camera. Obviously, if we're uh, recording lots of images very quickly, fast bursts of images, it's going to take up a lot less storage on the computer if we're recording in lower megapixel counts. So again, a reminder of that small raw dimensions, and we can see even the smaller raw file dimensions at 4,320 pixels on the longest dimension is still more than a 4K file, which is 3,840 pixels on that longest dimension. So even the small raw is, is, has enough megapixels to, uh, for our needs for a 4K screen image. Now, this, of course, would be very useful for instances where maybe a photographer is creating still images in the raw file format for creating a time-lapse movie using the interval shoot function. Uh, if we're just recording uh, those uh, um, smaller files, then, of course, uh, we're having to downsample less uh, when exporting those images in order to create that time-lapse uh, movie in post-production. Now, one of the, my patrons asked me, is, was there any advantages to maybe dynamic range or high ISO performance if we um, use the small RAW rather than the large RAW? Now, I ran a quick test and I actually 
couldn't see any advantages either to dynamic range or high ISO performance. Remember the, the sensor sights on the sensor are still the same size. We're not growing the sensor sights to say maybe compar comparing it to uh, an A7S3. Uh, we're still using the existing uh, sensor sights of that 50 megapixel. So I wasn't expecting to see any advantage uh, in either dynamic range or high ISO and that was borne out by my initial tests there. Of course, I did say that uh, some photographers won't want to shoot in small or medium RAW because they do find uh, advantages to shooting it with 50 megapixel uh, resolution, even if they only want um, uh, to output images for screen viewing on 4K screens. And here's one such example here where I'm exploiting the very wide aperture of my 135 prime, but of course I don't have quite the reach that I want, so I'm just cropping in post and I can pretty much exercise a two times crop in post production. I only really need a quarter of that 50 megapixel file so I can crop much tighter and so long as I'm using good uh, G or GM glass uh, I won't be disappointed with the amount of detail by cropping uh, quite so tightly in post production. And of course uh, this is also borne out in this example where I am at the maximum zoom of the lens 600 millimeters and I'm still not close enough to this uh, running Greyhound, but um, shooting with that um, 50 megapixels does give me the uh, option to crop entirely. I could, of course, uh, crop in APS-C mode in camera first and then crop more in post-production later because really I'm just looking for a 2160 pixel high image which will go the full height of a 4K monitor and you can see how generous a 50 megapixel image is that gives us that flexibility of cropping in post-production. Now for sports shooters, I possibly think that they won't be using the small or medium raw lossless compression. I expect that they will carry on shooting in the compressed file format because what happens um, by shooting in the compressed file format rather than the lossless compression is you're going to massively increase the number of frames that you can capture in a sequence of images at either 20 or 30 frames per second. When using a CF Express card and using the compressed file, uh, raw file format we almost have a limitless um, buffer that we can carry on capturing images to. The camera is very reluctant to want to slow down when shooting in the compressed raw file format at uh, the, uh, the 20 frames per second which is the high rather than high plus drive mode. If we are shooting in the high plus drive mode uh, we may get as many as 385 raw images. Now, some people will say, well, but I don't want to lose the, the quality by shooting in compressed. But I have to remind some photographers that most, uh, well, not, not most, but many um, uh, uh, pro sports photographers still shoot in the JPEG file format, which is 8-bit, 250 uh, levels per channel. And they're happy to just to do the editing on those JPEGs. Now, if we are shooting in the compressed raw file format, we're dropping the bit depth from 14 to 12 bits, but we have 4,096 uh, 4, levels per channel. They are very robust at... Um, at, uh, in post-production editing and we do have the extra dynamic range by having shot in the raw file format rather than JPEG. For many sports shooters that's more than enough quality. Uh, really I, I think the uncompressed or raw file format or the lossless compression format are really reserved for people maybe who are shooting um, landscapes and maybe into sun landscapes where you're recovering shadows by three or four stops this is really really where you want the uncompressed or lossless compression and you want the extra 14 bit depth for much higher quality shadows especially when we're lightening those shadows in post-production so one of the other um, improvements of the firmware update for the Alpha 1 in, with this version 1.3 was claimed improvements to the accuracy of the IAF. Now this firmware update for improving accuracy of IAF first appeared on the Alpha 7.4. Now I've never really seen that the accuracy of the IAF was particularly a problem for me, but I will outline where the problem exists now. So here, uh, this is a pre 
3 uh, firmware update. I'm now shooting with the 135 f1.8 at maximum aperture. And I'm just going to uh, get a little bit closer. You can see the IAF appears to be exceptionally accurate. And if we zoom in even more, we can see the eyelashes of that leading eye, the eye on the right side of the frame there are sharp. And we also see that the, um, the blood vessel on the, uh, the surface of the eye is also sharp. We're getting enough depth of field to put the, the eyelashes and the iris of the eye both sharp but it is possible to differentiate and uh, and then see where uh, Sony does actually prioritize the focus pre firmware update and uh, this is an example of where if we zoom in we'll see that the camera is prioritizing the eyelashes rather than the iris. You actually have to get very, very close to actually force this uh, IAF. Some, some will say it's an error. I never actually saw that it was a particular error, but some would prefer the focus to have been on the iris and not the eyelashes. Okay, so we can force this, uh, especially when we get uh, very close and we also turn uh, the portrait, uh, the head of the subject we're photographing at this three quarter angle. Again, sometimes you can sort of get away with this even before the firmware update as in this example here. Again, we can still see the eyeball and the uh, the eyelashes still are both sharp. We're losing focus on the, um, the eyebrow, um, but uh, we've still got uh, enough depth of field for the iris and the eyelashes in this particular shot. And I've borne that out by uh, various lenses, not just the 135. Here's the, um, the 35mm f1.4 GM. And again, going in really close, we could see that we had uh, enough depth of field. This is the 50mm f1.2 GM. I'll go in, uh, I'll actually step a little bit closer. By stepping closer, we actually... Um, uh, uh, start um, moving to a shallower depth of field, going in even closer. I'm not zooming, this is a prime lens, so I'm stepping closer. Now we can see the eyebrows going out of focus, but we still have um, both the eyelashes and the iris sharp, and that's because I think the subject is uh, uh, looking directly towards the camera. It's the, the head is not a, at a particular angle to the camera, so we've still got enough depth of field we could possibly force the eyelashes to be sharp and the iris to be slightly soft if we got even closer with this uh, f1.2 aperture. Uh, again, here I'm zooming to 100% just to show you both the eyelashes. This is all pre-firmware um, update, I hasten to add. So where the accuracy is coming is we're, we're basically going to be pushing um, the priority back from the eyelashes further towards the iris of the eye when we're working really, really close with very, very wide aperture um, lenses. Now, what I would always have suggested prior to firmware updates is if you are using one of these very wide aperture primes is maybe just simply, if you are working exceptionally close to your subject, simply just to stop down to f2.8 as I am doing in this particular instance here. We still have very shallow depth of field uh, when working at close proximity uh, with these particular lenses. Uh, but if we just want to expand the depth of field so we get the eyebrow, eyelashes and iris all sharp, I would have previously just said maybe consider stopping down to f2.8. Hopefully you found this uh, information about the uh, recent firmware update for the Alpha 1 useful. Just remember I do uh, offer ongoing uh, support uh, on my patreon.com um, support channel. Now this does cover Q&A forums, I have camera specific ebooks, uh, I also uh, provide cam set files so you can completely set up your Alpha 1 camera as uh, per outlined by that 500 page ebook just by copying a file to your memory card. I also have uh, lots of uh, member-only seminars. So here's a range of uh, ebooks. I also uh, have uh, um, ebooks on post-production editing and a range of other different topics uh, you can download. There are no contracts or commitments for this um, Patreon service. You can uh, subscribe and just stay for one month, uh, take uh, what resources you need and then unsubscribe.
And of course, I have lots of archives of uh, um, extended seminars for both uh, capture techniques and also post-production editing uh, for members to watch. And there's over 20 hours of movie support there. OK, so hopefully you found this useful. Just give me the thumbs up. Um, subscribe to the channel if you want ongoing support and consider that Patreon uh, membership. I'm Mark Gaylor, Sony Imaging Ambassador.